from the tribesmen of Papua New Guinea to Kazakh eagle hunters in Mongolia, photographer Jimmy Nelson takes us on an audiovisual odyssey in his latest series, The Last Sentinels, which zooms in on the indigenous communities living in harmony with our planet. Well, Jimmy, Jimmy joins us in the studio to tell us more. Welcome to the show. Good morning. The Last Sentinels is mm. this immersive experience of your photography that takes visitors on a journey from the South Pacific to the steppes of Central Asia. And these people's coexistence with nature is mm. really key in this series. What was the biggest lesson that you took away about their relationship with nature? Um, to be honest, living uh, in the moment and living in grace, living in respect and living with this very present idea that when they wake up in the morning, they look up literally into the sky before the sun rises, wherever you go in the world, and they say, we're here to serve you as opposed to us here in the developed world, which is the planet is here to serve us. That's the most simplest way of putting it. Hmm. Now, your photography is being exhibited at the Atelier des Lumières here in Paris. This mm -hmm. is an audiovisual space which makes for a very different experience to being in a gallery. We went along to see it for ourselves, so here's a preview. So the experience is very immersive, quite spectacular. How did you find this change in medium and how do you think it affects the way people see your images? Um, good question. I mean, first of all, you introduced me as a photographer. Um, I think as time has evolved and I'm now 52, I've been using a camera for the majority of my life as stills camera, but nowadays using a variety of mediums. So it originated as photography. Um, it's, for me, it's been this lifelong search in trying to communicate a feeling of, of wealth, of validity, of balance, perhaps even of happiness with these communities that I've been experiencing throughout my life. And I think for the very first time ever in my uh, existence, and perhaps for the viewer, you can sort of collate all this information presented in such a spectacular way. I don't believe there is anywhere else in the world, other than by Atelier Lumiere, that you can see such content in such a diverse multimedia facet. Now, The Last Sentinels is a hugely ambitious, very diverse mm. project that, as I said, took you all over the world. But was there one scene or one encounter from those travels that sticks in your mind or really sums up the project? Um, there are many. It's always very difficult. It's obviously a question which is asked on a regular basis. But I think I perhaps have to lean on one set of islands, the Marquesa Islands okay. in the Central Pacific, uh, in a strange way, probably some of the most remotest islands on the planet. And arriving there, I experienced what was for me the ultimate sense of, of balance in every way. I mean, there's this sort of beautiful androgeneity within the community. Everybody's accepted, everybody's loved, everybody's celebrated, and they truly live in harmony with the natural world. And because of their relative isolation, they're perhaps still allowed and are capable of doing that, although things are changing very mm. rapidly. They're now connected to the rest of us, and they're beginning to question, is this a valid existence or should we follow you? quickly into the developed world. Yeah. This was my next question yeah. for you about change. Mm. In this series, you do see children, you hear them as well mm. in the experience. Um, what about the next generation? Do you see them as the gatekeepers of their traditions or are they shifting towards more quote unquote Western ways of life? I think it's both. Um, you have to, it's about achieving a balance. I think often in sort of anthropological discussion and discovery, there's this idea they have to be protected or they have to be locked off. I think that's very naive. They have all the right to, to evolve and develop into the, uh, the modern world as we are, but it's how they do that. And I think we have to help each other. We have a small foundation in the project called the Jimmy Nelson Foundation. It's essentially reinvesting in, as you come to us in the developed world, don't abandon all your heritage. And at the same time, learn from us from some of the mistakes we've made, whilst at the same time, we can learn from you how best to live in a more connected way. So it's about finding a route down the middle. It's not black or white. It's a sort of more of a yin yang idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for a more classic gallery experience, but no less artistic, the photography of Sarah Moon is also on show at Paris's Museum of Modern Art. 
Emerging as a fashion photographer in the 1960s, Moon's now held for her unique and painterly approach to image making. Brian Quinn has this report. She's among France's premier female fashion photographers, known for her romantic heroines and her perfume ads from the 80s and 90s. But Sarah Moon is much more than that, a singular talent with an eye for the enigmatic, as mysterious as her images. Even her name is an alias. In her photos, women without faces, avoiding the viewer's gaze, much like the artist herself. Rarely filmed, she's seen here at the start of her photographic career. Timid, self-taught, and yet, since the start, her images have contained a stunning power. In Moon's work, each model becomes a film star from the 1930s. Even her ad campaigns for houses like Chanel and Dior were filmed on 35mm stock. With her hazy photographic stories, Sarah Moon sends the viewer back to an imagined childhood, a fictional past built from scratch. Her Polaroids damaged and stained, artificially aged with the utmost care. What she wants to say in making these technical accidents in these photographs is that there is in every accident a form of truth. Quelque chose qui, un accident, permet de faire apparaître des choses auxquelles on n'était pas préparé. Images like living entities with the power to move imaginations. Now, as we saw there, there's a staged quality to Sarah Moon's work, and she herself has said she's not a photographer of real life, but mm -hmm. the director of a fictional film she'll mm -hmm. never shoot. Mm -hmm. Now, you've said the same thing mm -hmm. about your own images. They're not documentary truth, but artistic inter interpretation. If we take a look at one portrait here mm -hmm. of Huli Wigman in Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. this is an incredible image. Can you tell us how you set up that shot and what the staging of it represents? Um, staging is relative. I think the, the truth is in the eye of the beholder. Every single picture that has ever been made is going to be subjective. It is going to be staged because it's going to be the photographer's eye of interpretation. My eye is one of dignity, is one of respect, it's one of patience, and it's one of trying to shine the most respectful light and poise and imaginable on the subject. Often what evolves into the discussion is is this actually how they really look? Is this actually how they really are? And it is. I just think it's probably for one of the first times that such a large body of work and group of people have been presented in such a way. Traditionally, when we present ourselves in the developed world in this position, we never question whether we are or we're not this uh, uh, aesthetically defined. In this particular case, this is actually how they look, but rarely has somebody, in my case, spent so much time and so much love and passion presenting them in such a way. And arranging the... the for, well, for arranging, the arranging, this is, I, I arrive, I often spend months with one community and 0.1% uh, of the time is spent actually making the picture. The majority of the time before that is, is the introduction, is the trust, is the kindness, is the patience, is the looking. And the one message is come to me when you're ready and come to me at your most dignified. Mm -hmm. So it is their presentation, but I give them time and space to come to me in, in that poise. Yeah. Because there is occasionally controversy about the representation mm -hmm. of people in, in images. Mm -hmm. There have been critics who mm -hmm. say that, for example, certain photos can present a mm -hmm. false or misleading account of the people you photograph. But what is the larger concern here, do you think? Because in other... With other subject matter, mm -hmm. the blurring of fact and fiction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is not so problematic. So why do you think it's still controversial? I think it's controversial because it hurts. And why would that be? It hurts because then it reflects and it mirrors on the pain that we're suffering here in the developed world. I think it's so easy. Look at the way we live outside. Look at the way the introduction to the, the Sentinels is in Lumiere. It's this concrete disconnection. Look at the way people treat each other in this city here. Everybody is angry. Everybody is sad. I think that's why it hurts, and that's why there's this discussion. And the beauty and the kindness and love and the sincerity you see and feel through the eyes which communicates to the picture is actually what we're all longing for. Mm. And I think we've lost it. I think it's so easy. Mm. Yeah. Now, 
Profits mm. from the shows at the Atelier des Lumières mm. go to your foundation, which you mentioned it works uh, with people all around the world on humanitarian mm -hmm. and cultural projects. Mm -hmm. Now, the protection of indigenous people is a social emergency, but it's also mm. ultimately a political issue. Mm -hmm. If we had to name some positive initiatives, let's look on the bright side here, mm -hmm. from governments or private actors mm -hmm. who are setting a good example mm -hmm. in this field, could you think of ones? There's a group in uh, Ecuador. Uh, they're looking after and working with a group called Hawarawani. They're a group of Indians living in the Amazon rainforest. And up until recently, uh, the government wanted to remove them to exploit the minerals. But when they actually realized the long-term value of keeping the community there as the protectors of the natural resources would actually be a better investment, they've left them. And that came from a variety of photographers, filmmakers, writers, and journalists um, calling action to them. Well, so it doesn't have a specific title, but it, it's a story of success, yeah. Well, that is very reassuring. Now, finally, we asked you to flag up something on your cultural radar, mm -hmm. and you named an exhibition in Amsterdam from an artist who needs no introduction. Can you tell us more? Well, I actually live next to, we call it the Museumplein. That's the Museum Square in Amsterdam. I lived there for about 24 years, and I live next to the Van Gogh Museum. And the Van Gogh doesn't obviously need an introduction, but something that's spectacular at the moment is there's an exhibition of his letters and his writing. And I think what actually makes him the artist that he is and the inspiration for all of us as human beings and the most popular visited museum in Amsterdam is not necessarily the illustrations that hang on the wall of his portraits or the sunflowers, is the fact that he's used words to express love, passion, search and connection. And I think that's what makes it an extraordinarily rich exhibition. A new dimension yeah. of the artist yeah. there. Thank yeah. you very much for the tip, Jimmy. And you can catch The Last Sentinels at the Atelier des Lumières until the end of the month. We'll leave you with a preview of that Van Gogh show. That's on in Amsterdam. Do remember to check out our website for more arts and culture, and you can keep up with us on social media channels too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this.